people. Um, great. So thanks everybody for joining today. This is uh, pretty exciting, the Carbon Leadership Forum Toronto chapter. We have two fantastic speakers here today, but before I introduce them, I'd just like to set a few little ground rules. The way that we've structured this is we'll have two, um, two, two speakers giving two talks, and they'll be 20 minutes each. Uh, we will be looking for questions that'll be in the chat. If you could please use the chat function, we will have question period at the very end. So um, now I'm going to give a very quick introduction. Our first speaker is going to be Rob Bolan. And Rob is with in Introba. In there we go. So the Introba. And also with MEP 2040. He's actually, the, I think, the chair of um, the uh, 2040 challenge, the MEP 2040 challenge. Rob is in California. Um, he has uh, done a lot of work on many lead platinum projects, uh, net zero energy projects, uh, lots going on in California. He's also a lead fellow. We're very honored and happy to have Rob explain to us the nitty gritty of MEP 2040. And then after Rob, it'll be Kara, and Kara is our very own Toronto MEP engineer, and she is a principal at Hammerschlag and Joffe, and Kara is going to be talking about her experience um, with MEP 2040. So without further ado, maybe I'll let Rob, if you want to take over and get started, thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Susan, uh, and good afternoon to everybody. Good uh, morning to me, and uh, I guess Happy New Year. Uh, 2023 is, is definitely going to be an interesting uh, year for us as we go forward. Just a couple of, uh, of quick things. Uh, I'm a senior principal with Introba. It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. I recognize that. Uh, many of you will uh, recognize the, the previous uh, name for our firm, Integral Group, uh, which uh, is a little bit more easy uh, to the ear. But Introba is a recent uh, rebranding and merger that we've, uh, as a firm, have undergone uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, I am also a member of the steering committee, uh, not the chair, but a member of the steering committee of MEP 2040. I've got a slide and I'll uh, sort of flash here in a minute. Uh, my uh, uh, co-steering committee members uh, of that group, but it, I do chair the the communications and resources working group uh, as part of that. And uh, that'll be something uh, that we'll go through and, and I'll give you an introduction to uh, what exactly these working groups are doing and, and hopefully encourage uh, many of you uh, who are interested to, to get involved and participate. Okay, so the MEP 2040. Uh, you know, what, what it is is a, a group of MEP engineering design firms that have really sort of come together to make commitments in terms of taking specific actions, which include reducing uh, the GWP refrigerants, uh, requesting data on uh, uh, environmental performance for manufacturers, and becoming essentially active participants uh, as a group in industry-wide efforts to decarbonize building systems. Uh, we've been sort of the sort of the the tail end uh, of the building movement with regard to decarbonization, and it's, it's really time for MEP uh, and the systems and materials that we design to really pick up uh, momentum and, and become part of what we're trying to do here. So the commitment itself: all systems engineers shall advocate for and achieve net zero carbon in their projects, operational carbon by 2030, and embodied carbon by 2040. This initiative, uh, as I said, was developed by members of the Carbon Leadership Forum and then pulled in a group of other like-minded uh, individuals from firms really uh, designed to ignite building designers, owners, and manufacturers to, to meet the embodied carbon ben benchmarks uh, and ambitious reduction goals that we really need to be partic participating in and be recognized for the significant role they can play towards getting to these uh, targets. There are four uh, commitments 
that uh, signatory firms uh, take on board. The first one, establish a company plan to reduce operational and embodied carbon across MEP systems on all projects, targeting zero by 2040, uh, and then measure and report progress against that plan annually. The second one, uh, coming to what we specify, requesting low GWP refrigerant availability when designing systems to reduce or eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from refrigerants. There's a lot of work that's being done within the working group around this, and I'll sort of give you a quick overview of what that is here in just a couple of minutes. The third is to request environmental product declarations in pro uh, project specifications for MEC system components. This is something where it's uh, quite a bit more common nowadays architectural products, structural products, uh, to be including requirements around environmental product declarations. It's much less common for this to be happening in MEP system components. There are products out there uh, for the systems that we uh, specify and design uh, that do have EPDs, but there are a whole heck of a lot more that do not have EPDs. And so part of this movement is really uh, to get this uh, to get some, motiv uh, some motivation and uh, acceleration of our uh, product vendors uh, to be moving this forward faster. And the fourth is to participate in a quarterly MEP forum uh, and CLF community discussion group to share lessons learned and contribute to a growing body of knowledge. Here's the steering committee. Uh, and our, our chair is actually Julie Janiski from Bureau Happold. You see her in the top row uh, over there to the right. Uh, we meet uh, on a monthly basis, and each of us are actively involved in uh, various working groups, which I'll uh, uh, give you a quick overview here in just a minute. In terms of the commitment so far, and this is a very new initiative, it must be said. We started this uh, officially at the beginning of 2022. Uh, to date, by the end of 2022, we have uh, 58 signatory firms. And to be a signatory firm uh, takes C-suite commitment. You need to get uh, an executive who can make the commitment for the firm uh, that you are going to undertake and, and uh, participate with those four uh, critical commitment areas that I described before. Uh, we do have 58 signatory firms to date. Uh, in the upper right, in the lower left, these are supporter firms. Uh, and so while, while they don't have specifically MEP engineering design capabilities in-house, uh, they are uh, essentially our partners in the industry. Uh, and you can, can see a number of them are uh, industry trade organizations, uh, such as AIA and ASHRAE. Uh, there's a number of architects uh, that participate, uh, many of which that we all work with uh, on projects. Uh, and so we are all swimming in the same direction with respect to this initiative and how MEP 2040 rolls up uh, and uh, is uh, essentially hand in glove with what's happening on the structural side and on the architectural side in terms of embodied carbon. So a uh, very quick overview that I'll go through for each of the four uh, pieces that we have. Establishing a company plan. Okay, uh, so what we're looking for the signatories to do uh, is to develop a plan to reduce operational carbon, targeting zero by 2040. 2030 is the operation, sorry, the operational uh, is targeted by 2040 with an intent to try and get to 2030. And then a plan to reduce embodied carbon for the projects we design uh, by 2040. So what we expect firms to do is set clear targets, evolve those targets from year to year based on the specific specifics that are happening within their firm, uh, define the action items needed to achieve the targets, whether that's training, uh, scope gap uh, issues, reviewing standards, specifications, typical details, uh, how you incorporate low GWP refrigerants into your BODs, uh, and then requesting EPDs from vendors for all projects. And then of course, measure and report that annual progress. This is something that each of the firms, uh, the signatory firms is going through right now, uh, putting together our sort of combined reports uh, that uh, are going to then be shared and posted on the MEP 2040 website. In terms of company plans, I've got a just a quick snapshot uh, from our 
uh, colleagues at Bureau Happel. This is not specifically related to embodied carbon, these particular graphics, but these are graphics that come out of their, uh, their annual sustainability plan. Uh, many of our firms uh, in Troba as well, we've got our annual sustainability and ESG reporting that we do, what we are uh, putting together in terms of our reporting is, is gonna be a subset that gets captured in our annual ESG. Uh, in this particular case, uh, and this is something that is not specifically related to MEP 2040, but is related to how firms are, are typically reporting through their sustainability plans, uh, is that it's not just about the buildings we design, it's also about uh, how we walk the walk with regard to our own operating principles. So how we are capturing uh, scope one direct emissions, uh, scope two indirect and scope three indirect emissions, and how we're then reporting on that so that we can see sort of the increase incremental progress going forward for how we operate as well as for the projects that we're designing for our clients. In terms of refrigerants, uh, this has been a very active uh, working group and there are actually a couple of sub working groups that are participating within this particular area. Uh, and again, as a reminder, request low GWP refrigerant availability when designing systems to reduce or eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from those refrigerants. When we, when we look back on the history of, uh, you know, refrigerants and, you know, where they came to the fore in terms of the level of importance, there was really sort of an initial focus on ozone depletion uh, potential, the ODP, right? Um, and to some degree, you could say almost to the detriment of global warming uh, uh, potential, the GWP. Uh, and this was really in, in, you know, reaction to the increasing sort of uh, environmental emergency of a growing ozone hole uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, and so, you know, the industry, not just our industry, but industries in general have done a great job actually of uh, closing that gap and, and closing the ozone hole. However, what has happened is that there's been this, uh, this sort of reverse reaction in terms of the global warming potential. There was an inflection point after the Montreal Protocol where we started seeing global warming potential going up while the ODP was going down. And so now we're in the position where we're, there's a, we, we've solved the ODP issue essentially, uh, and now we need to uh, uh, rapidly and uh, uh, increasingly address the global warming potential. And so that's where we are headed now. Um, in terms of the properties of the refrigerants, you can see you know, where we're, what we're moving from and to in the graphic uh, at the bottom of the page, R32, R122, two, three, four ZE, uh, really the, the sort of spectrum that we start to look at, uh, we're able to sort of evaluate uh, not just on GDP, but also on ODP. So you can see along the top line there in terms of impact, the ODP really has been more or less resolved. And now the GWP, how do we get uh, to these uh, super low uh, uh, down to, to close to zero uh, GWP refrigerants? There's a number of refrigerant data sets that are available uh, out there, uh, whether it's related to equipment life expectancy, refrigerant leakage, refrigerant environmental metrics. Some are you know, US-based, some are uh, based in the UK or elsewhere. Uh, so it really is about you know, using these particular data sets to then drop into uh, a tool that the MEP 2040 group with the uh, support of Euro Happold, have been working to develop, and this is now posted uh, on the MEP 2040 website, a very simple uh, 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 tool for refrigerant impact, uh, which is sort of a calculator where we can put in uh, information uh, around the type of equipment, what it's, uh, uh, what the refrigerant uh, uh, being planned for is what the refrigerant charges, leakage rate, et cetera. Very simple tool so that we can do some, some early phase design planning as we're going through looking at uh, how to uh, limit or uh, eliminate the, uh, uh, the, the GWP that we have associated with some of these uh, sort of large uh, bases of equipment. And then with, with respect to the reporting mechanism, uh, there is a, a very active dialogue that the MEP 2040 uh, uh, design and reporting uh, uh, working group 
uh, is having with AIA uh, 2030. Uh, many of us are well familiar with the 2030 DDX uh, database tool uh, that is, you know, typically being used to report on operational uh, uh, energy performance uh, for the buildings that we are designing uh, and operating. Uh, what we've been talking with them about uh, is how this can then perhaps uh, incorporate also uh, information on refrigerant emissions. So it becomes really sort of a, an opportunity for a one-stop shop in terms of environmental reporting. So there's the, the energy associated with the buildings uh, and then the refrigerant emissions associated with the equipment for the buildings that we are designing. The third piece that we have here, uh, requesting EPDs, and this is a very specific working group that we have that is uh, engaging now with vendors. Um, so, uh, you know, request EPDs in project specifications for MEP system components is something that is, again, relatively new to the MEP uh, world in terms of Division 22, 23, 25, 26. Uh, you know, not something that we have typically done, even though. As I said before, a lot of the architectural and structural specifications have got language related to the materials that they have because those are much more mature in terms of the data that's available. Uh, so what is an EPD and why are they important? EPDs are documents that uh, provide uh, quantified environmental data using predetermined parameters and uh, where relevant additional environmental information. They uh, can provide comprehensive reporting that discloses an environmental impacts uh, of a product over its cradle to grave life cycle. <clears throat> so what's key about an EPD is that it is an internationally recognized single comprehensive disclosure of a product's environmental impact throughout its life cycle. Okay, so this whole uh, cradle to grave or I guess cradle to cradle uh, uh, environmental performance uh, becomes increasingly uh, important. And then how we calculate the LCA data uh, by that uh, to drop into the EPD. This is sort of the process uh, that uh, vendors uh, have been going through in terms of creating the EPDs for their particular product lines. In terms of the uh, how what a timeline might look like for MEP 2040 uh, products, um, what we've been talking about at the MEP 2040 group uh, is creating a concise, coordinated, phased implementation to help remove barriers to acquiring EPDs for manufactured products. There's a lot, there, there's some stuff that's out there, uh, but there's mostly stuff that is not available. Uh, and, and that's because a lot of vendors just haven't gotten started. And it takes time. It takes about a two year period for, uh, for, for many products to be able to produce an EPD. I've talked with certain vendors who are uh, who have been able to get through, uh, uh, you know, faster timelines. Uh, and I'll, you know, we'll, we'll have a, in our quarterly one forum, which I'll talk about just very briefly toward the end of my uh, section here, uh, we're going to have a couple of vendors actually come on to talk about sort of their journey with regard to going down the EPD uh, uh, path. Um, owners and designers would like to know which MEP products to prioritize first in specifications and which can be phased in over time. Uh, manufacturers would like to know the best place to invest in obtaining the right EPD data to meet a known future project demand. So to assist in the prioritization, uh, we're, we're proposing an industry adopted phased implementation plan to bring EPDs online over a period of years. Uh, this allows a coordinated industry-wide effort to prioritize manufacturer EPD investment over a period of years rather than, uh, you know, months. The goal for owners and designers uh, would be to, to, to essentially specify um, uh, stuff that can be, uh, that we can actually uh, uh, show as, as meeting the, uh, the EPD targets uh, over a period of time. Uh, the upper track on this timeline lists the timeline for submission of SIPC TM65 material breakdown. And then the lower track outlines when EPD data would be available to contractors to show compliance with the EPD requirements and specifications. Uh, 
there is a heavy reliance at the moment uh, within what we're trying to do on the CIPSI TM65 data, because they have spent, uh, in the UK, they've spent the last couple of years uh, with, uh, in, in Troba, very uh, integrally involved in this, uh, in terms of developing the EPD information that then creates sort of a database of industry-wide information that can be used as uh, sort of an industry placeholder until uh, very detailed and specific EPDs are available from uh, manufacturers. Contributing to a growing body of knowledge. This is the last one. So participate in quarterly MEP 2040 forums uh, and a CLF community discussion group to share lessons learned and contribute to a growing body of knowledge. So we, we had four of those uh, the, this past year in 2022. Uh, they were all terrific, very well uh, attended, very well uh, received, a lot of uh, participation from the folks in the audience. We are generally trying to target a particular area. And the quarter one forum uh, for 2023, which will be happening in early March, uh, is targeting manufacturers and EPDs, as I've sort of just described. We're also well, very I guess, active. Because I guess, wasn't this off? And then we turned it on. Actually, we're, no we're also very actively uh, seeking uh, participation in the working groups, right? The communications and resources working group, which I chair, there's the data analysis and reporting that is uh, very specifically working on refrigerants. Uh, there's manufacturers and EPDs, uh, which I just described, and then partnerships. Out of the partnerships, we're looking actually to spin off a new uh, uh, working group that is very uh, specifically focused on advocacy and policy so that we're able to now sort of address how we can interact with governmental agencies and NGOs uh, in terms of helping to develop policy around embodied carbon related to uh, MEP. Uh, and then here's a just a quick snapshot of one of the pages of the MEP 2040 website. Here's where we have our sort of announcement for the MEP 2040 forum coming up on March 2nd. I would encourage all of you, and I've got a in my final slide, the MEP2040.org website listing uh, for everybody to go to, to really sort of look through what we're trying to do here uh, with the MEP2040. Okay, so very quickly, I'm gonna very quickly go through a 2022 year in review so that we uh, have uh, an update for all of you uh, here that are participating today uh, to see what we've been up to. Uh, so we've grown from, from zero to 58 signatory firms, we now have 30 supporting organizations. Uh, both of them are growing. Uh, we have 100 plus active working group members across those four working groups. And we've had the four quarterly forums. Uh, the last one that we had in uh, uh, back in uh, early December was focused on uh, uh, what's happening uh, uh, in, uh, in the policy area. So there was a member from uh, uh, President Biden's White House uh, staff uh, that participated, and then uh, uh, Megan Lewis from CLF participated. Really terrific forum. These are all recorded. You can go to our website, and you know you have the ability actually to to uh, watch them on YouTube via links from our website. In terms of the resources, we've developed three call to action uh, letters uh, in terms of outreach to. Trade partners, uh, outreach to uh, 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 MEP uh, uh, vendors uh, for product data and information related to uh, low GWP refrigerants and uh, e EPDs. Uh, the refrigerant calculator that I've sort of described in the slide deck that you'll get a copy of uh, will include actually a few slides that have got a couple of examples of what the, what's that sort of works through. Uh, but I didn't want to sort of bog us down here today in terms of going through that uh, live on here, but there is something that you'll get in the slide deck uh, that uh, will accompany this uh, after we're finished. This refrigerant calculator uh, tool is really a, a useful uh, element for us, especially early in design. There's a social media toolkit uh, that the communications and resources team have, have sort of developed really to help uh, continue to grow our movement so that we are not just uh, uh, gaining momentum, but we are accelerating. And then there's a lot of awareness that we've got where we are uh, being recognized and, and giving presentations uh, at uh, major conferences. Uh, the MEP 2040 uh, initiative was uh, referenced in the White House fact sheet that came out in December uh, of last year. Uh, and so uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, movement and motivation that's happening uh, in these areas. 
one of the things uh, that we ask our signatories to do when they sign up and when they commit, you know, give us give us some information, you know, as to why it's important to you. And so there's some just some tremendous motivational uh, 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 quotes that uh, we have gotten from all of our signatories that again are uh, accessible to some degree via the website so you can see what uh, you know is motivating our our signatories embodied carbon is the next uh, frontier we must alter our professional practices and encourage our clients and the entire design and construction industry to join with us to change the course of the planet's future this is critical for our planet and future generations survival Right. It's really, really great stuff. People are doing it for the right reasons. In terms of the look ahead, it is all about uh, momentum and acceleration. So we've got, you know, the 58 signatory firms. Can we double that? We've got 30 supporting organizations. Can we, you know, double that? Uh, you know, getting MEP firms to be now developing their plans and submitting them for sharing and review and essentially creating a level of transparency among you know those of us who often compete for project work but we recognize we're all in this together how many manufacturers provide epds how can we accelerate that and then how do we integrate uh, what we're doing in terms of the mep 2040 with uh, the architecture 2030 uh, uh, initiative and the structural engineering 2050 initiative these are all we're all we all sort of land under the uh, Carbon Leadership Forum umbrella, so we should all be talking together. And at the moment, we're a North American sort of organization, largely US-based, but as you can see, we've, we've been referencing standards uh, in the UK, and we, do, uh, we are starting to gain participation uh, within the MEP 2040 uh, uh, environment from people uh, in different parts of the world, and how do we grow this? Uh, internationally so that this becomes a much more significant movement and commitment around the world. So looking ahead, how can we be, be better? Draft plans and questionnaire for signatories Do quarter one of 2023. We're all actively working on this. And then how, how do we take that data and with reporting mechanism, start to be able to sort of peel away parts of the onion so that we've got not just overall data, but now very specific data about uh, how things are, are moving in the healthcare and science sector, mixed use sector, residential sector, educational sector, so on and so forth, so that we know where to sort of focus attention if we uh, have uh, certain sectors where there's uh, things are lagging. Okay. So I know I've got my uh, Q&A slide here, but I am going to turn it over now to Kara. Hello, everyone. So you should now be able to see my screen. Um, I'm delighted to share time with you today. Uh, my name is Kara Sloat. I'm a principal at Hammerschlag and Joffe on the mechanical side. Um, so I've been invited to talk to you about how this big context that you can see coming from uh, the CLF is really working for us, boots on the ground as a signatory to the MEP 2040 challenge. So Hammerschlag and Joffe has taken on this challenge this year, like many other um, organizations. So we're actively in the midst of developing our planning. Um, and I'm gonna share with you what we found so far, where we're at, what we think looks like it will be easy and what we think will be harder. Um, and all of that within the Ferrano context. So, you know, the first thing to say is, why do we need this specific challenge? Why, why does Hammerschlag and Joffe see this as important? There are a lot of people in the Ontario marketplace and Canadian marketplace already advocating for zero carbon buildings. So is there a role for us specifically? I think the biggest reason that we saw this as important is that um, we are a rapidly renewable um, element of the building. More than any other sector, we get replaced um, every eight years for lighting, um, you know, eight to 12, we get to replaced under 20 for boilers and chillers. Um, we, we come before windows and walls and roofs. And so there's going to be more opportunity to decarbonize buildings using HVAC than there will be with any other part of the building system. So given that we need to make deep cuts, 43% by 2030, um, our contribution to the industry, I think, is really critical. 
Another important reason to act is that um, looking globally, not just at uh, the sources of emissions in buildings, but the sources of emissions from everything that is human directed on the planet. Um, there's an organization called Project Drawdown that developed a plan to limit global warming to 1.5 degree. And if we do it, they need 80 solutions to all come together. And one of the biggest single systems, the most meaningful one that has, has to happen in the building systems is preventing fugitive refrigerant emissions and switching to alternative refrigerants. That's more important than energy efficient heating. So we also know we will see air conditioning proliferating um, over the next 20 years as global temperatures rise and more and more buildings become uncomfortable or even unoccupiable without active conditioning. So this is another place where uh, the mechanical sector has a critical role to play. Um, and finally, this challenge is really important because it empowers us as an organization to advocate for improved design as a stakeholder. So when our clients uh, provide net zero buildings, that contributes to our corporate goals and allows us to improve in our reporting. So it lets us come to the table with you know, more skin in the game. Um, and it also helps direct easy priority setting for us. Um, many of the people I can see on the call are consultants or are people who have a wide variety of balls in the air. So being able to make this action easy um, is a really big benefit of this program. So implementing MEP 2040 in year one, where are we at? Um, there's four things we need to do, tracking and reporting, uh, addressing refrigerants, asking for EPDs and capacity building. So the easy thing um, is asking our suppliers to change what they're doing and showing up to meetings. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that first because uh, although the change in the industry that's required is hard, um, our action and contribution is easier. Um, I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time on this last big challenge, which is tracking, reporting, and planning how we get all of the buildings that we design to net zero by 2040. So within the refrigerant sector, um, a big challenge for the Canadian marketplace is that um, the selected refrigerants of choice for replacing air conditioning refrigerants today are mostly in the A2L family. So those are low global warming potential, low flammability and low toxicity, but they're not not flammable, um, which means that they are not currently uh, allowed by CSA B52. So there are active um, efforts underway to change that legislation. CSA B52 changes have been drafted and will be uh, in line to be approved in the spring. And then we need to get those changes adopted and rolled into each of the province's legislation so that we can actually start using these new refrigerants. And that would allow us to transition uh, systems like VRF onto these new refrigerants. Um, a separate challenge in the refrigerant sector is that there are currently maximum heat pump system sizes uh, beyond which a stationary engineer, so somebody on site 24 seven with a certain training would be required. And that would be cost prohibitive for a lot of our building owners. So we need to figure out how to navigate that challenge while still providing enough heating for some of the biggest buildings in our market. In terms of HVAC products and material concerns, um, we saw that uh, as an organization, the MEP 2040 challenge is going to be working with manufacturers to provide EPDs for a larger and larger selection of mechanical equipment. Um, but overall, our sector has been substantially lagging behind other divisions using environmental and health uh, product declarations. So, um, a recent article in the ASHRAE Journal showed where we need to focus to limit both health hazards and uh, carbon emissions and identified some of the highest pri priority substitutions as uh, insulation, wire coatings, and piping. One of the things that we liked about that is that those are fairly simple products where there has been more progress on reporting. So for us, um, that's one of the places that we intend to focus in our first year. So our plan this year is still underway, um, but we're intending to send our calls to action. Um, we are working on creating databases of available and acceptable low GWP ACNR products. So finding out who does have chillers, heat pumps, 
um, and other products that we can use um, that have approved refrigerants and tracking where the legislation is at um, and throwing our weight behind efforts to speed that up so that we have access to better products. Um, and revising our specifications to include these requirements um, or requests for EPDs um, so that we can start getting that on the radar of the people bidding on our products. Now for the biggest challenge, how do we reduce operational and embodied carbon from the MEP systems that we design across every project we have to zero by 2040, so 17 years? You know, we know heat pumps are going to be in there. We know we need to deal with emergency power. We know we need a strategy to deal with um, late adopters. But we are actively thinking about this like everyone else in the industry. Um, and the year one plan is a lot easier than the year 17 plan. Uh, you know, challenge number one is really working with our client groups and figuring out who is likely to work with us to do net zero buildings, letting them know that we are game, that we have the technical capacity to deliver um, and actively encouraging them and supporting them. And then having a plan in our office on how we move through the entirety of the people that we serve to influence them to move ahead of legislative requirements to decarbonize their buildings. So each of the different sectors and clients we work with will have a different path to net zero. And we need to come up with a way to deal with that. I think many people on the call will understand that they also have that challenge. Um, challenge number two will be the performance gap. So despite five substantial energy code improvements as of 2019, research that Sidewalk Labs did showed that we had not had a measurable impact on MERB energy efficiency in Toronto. The MERBs that we built in 1998 used the same amount of energy as the ones we built in 2019. So the models that we're pre uh, preparing don't actually predict efficiency well. Uh, we know that space heating use and domestic hot water in particular are higher than predicted. So our plan needs to figure out how we can both close the prediction gap and account for actual energy use in the tracking and reporting that we're doing. Um, furthermore, we know that the better efficiency gets, uh, the more market forces can drive towards using lower insulation assemblies because it's no longer uncomfortable next to a wall of glass. So we, we need to work with the City of Toronto on um, continuing to support the Toronto Green Standard, continuing to um, work on building types with less glass. Um, we need air tightness testing to be uh, come required because um, the more energy that's lost through the wells, the more the HVAC system needs to use. And we know that thermal bridging is currently poorly understood. Um, there's a variety of people working on this and it is getting better, but we know that today these are not things that are well accounted for in our energy models. Challenge number three, we can decarbonize our buildings by switching to electricity in Ontario and then have natural gas added back to our generation mix. There's currently a lot of uncertainty about whether or not Ontario's grid will continue to decarbonize or it, we will add uh, more natural gas and end up uh, with increasing emissions related to which fuels that we've selected and how we use those fuels. Uh, one path to limiting that liability is designing buildings that use energy um, optimally at times of day when we know the carbon will remain low. So uh, the amount of carbon that's generated by the Ontario grid in specific is much lower overnight than it is at peak hours. So factors like battery storage, thermal energy storage, and photovoltaics provide a much better carbon bang for their buck than they will um, have on paper if we're not thinking about those factors. Um, at the moment, though, this is not well accounted for in carbon accounting. So we need to figure out how we can both take credit for this and drive it into more of our projects. As if that wasn't hard enough, we do work across Canada. So we actually need to have a similar understanding and plan in all of the provinces that we uh, work in. Alberta is a particular challenge because their grid is currently very dirty, um, but there is a different context everywhere in Canada. Not only that, the actions that we're planning could impact how effectively um, the decarbonization 
actually works. So by adding heat pumps to the grid, we potentially drive the grid to turn on more natural gas generators. So this uh, graph on the screen is from a study done by uh, the Toronto 2030 district. They looked at what would happen if we took the entire downtown Toronto district and put it on to uh, either electric resistance or air source heat pumps or hybrid heat pumps. And we found that we would more than triple the grid peak while moving it to winter if we had air source heat pump systems that default to backup electric resistance in the coldest weather. So as MEP practitioners on a building by building basis, having uh, sort of air source heat pumps that can operate to minus 18 and then turn on a backup system is acceptable, but at a grid level, it's not going to work. So we need a strategy as an industry to figure out how to deal with this. Um, and then even on the building level, the available capacity for electrification um, is going to be in competition with a variety of other added electrical loads. Many of the older buildings we work in didn't have air conditioning, but want to add it. Um, they don't have EV car charging and they have to add it. So we have to um, evaluate how we can add heat pumps to these mix without um, impacting the total consumption for the buildings. That makes our electrical engineering partners a really critical part of our team. Challenge number five, um, it's currently more expensive in many provinces to run a heat pump uh, to heat a building compared to running natural gas. Um, although recent price increases have changed how this uh, graph I've got on the screen shakes out, uh, the spark gap, electricity versus gas, is uh, an ongoing issue as we're trying to move our cost conscious clients to more um, low carbon fuels. Challenge number six is that um, with the changing climate, resilience has become a big focus. And most of the resilient and emergency fuels available are currently hydrocarbons. In Toronto in particular, our most resilient uh, utility network is the natural gas network. So if the city of Toronto wants us to put in a two day backup natural gas generator, um, then we're actually bringing gas to a new building site that maybe otherwise didn't need natural gas at all. Um, and we might even be driven towards exploring cogeneration, um, which increases building carbon emissions significantly while adding that resilience. So this tension needs to be addressed both in our own practice and uh, as, as a practice in Toronto. Challenge number seven um, is mixed messaging around district energy. So there has in the past been, I think, a conflation of district energy as a concept and low carbon district energy, there are a number of very compelling and really exciting um, net zero district energy projects in Toronto. Uh, Toronto Western Hospital has recently implemented a sewer heat recovery system that is dynamite. Um, I know that there are people on this call um, who have been exploring full geothermal based district systems. These are incredibly important elements of moving our uh, decarbonization efforts forward. But there are district systems that have, I think, a harder time with a clear transition from where they sit today with boilers that are in space constrained locations with limited access to alternate fuels um, that could be conceived of as having um, an inherent benefit because they are district energy. So figuring out how we decarbonize buildings that come to us on those systems, how we um, work with those systems to further decarbonize is going to be an ongoing challenge for us, especially working in our downtown existing um, systems. And finally, challenge number eight, heat pumps are not good enough yet. So we know that uh, if we were working in Texas, we could heat every building that we worked in. Um, and we would never have to go to electric resistance backup. Um, in Toronto, we have access to cold climate heat pumps full of R410A refrigerant with high global warming potential, or we have access to low GWP heat pumps at price points that are three times the cost. So all of these challenges just mean that there isn't a wide enough variety of products available. And as a very Northern country, 
um, we have some of the most extreme needs for heat pump performance in terms of, of climate. So if you look at Ontario in specific, this uh, slide just shows how as you move out of the GTA and northwards, you move out of uh, space where it's appropriate to use a, a mini split for heating without backup to where you could use a multi split to where only VRF would work or even it, it's too cold for that. So we really do need that product category to backfill. Knowing that all of those challenges are in place, uh, you know, our number one priority this year is to start tracking, to learn where we are at and start mapping out where we're going. Um, so we'll be implementing spreadsheet-based uh, energy modeling tracking results. We're going to use the energy models that are uh, prepared at building permit um, to figure out how our designs perform on paper. Uh, we're going to map interim reduction targets and we're going to perform our year-end reporting. In the near future, we are exploring Energy Compass, which is another tool developed by RWDI locally that will give us better uh, visibility into how those energy models um, actually break down and into the components of energy consumption in the buildings that we're designing. Um, we're going to be looking at adding uh, the embodied carbon that we get from EPDs and other data to our tracking. And we're going to explore how we can use Energy Portfolio Manager to try and uh, start thinking about the performance gap. So how our buildings perform in practice compared to how they performed on paper. And then our key takeaways, where do we have to focus in the next five years? Mechanically, we know that we have to ask manufacturers not only for the load GWT, P refrigerants and EPDs, but we need more cold climate suitable heat pump products. Um, we need products suitable for retrofit and especially for buildings with higher distribution temperatures um, in their hydronics. We need to support fast tracking of that A2L refrigerant legislation. Um, we need to accelerate electrification of building heating, but really keep paying attention to those peak load issues. We need to be aware of and talking about how our district energy systems interact with our planned decarbonization efforts. Uh, building a natural gas district energy plant today will not support our 2040 goals. Um, and we've identified a couple of key priority spaces for EPDs. So for mechanical, that's insulation and CPDC. Um, for electrical, it's wire coatings. Um, electrically, trying to find backup solutions outside of natural gas generators. Um, so starting to talk to our suppliers about getting CSA approval for a wider variety of batteries um, and communicating with our clients and with utilities about the grid power limitations we can expect to see and how we can mitigate those. So that's where we're at and what we're thinking about. Um, and I'm excited about talking uh, about what you guys are thinking about too. Thank you so much for your attention. Great. Great. Thank you very much, both Rob and Kara. That was amazing. Um, so we can open this up for questions. I do know we saw a really interesting one that did come in the chat when Rob, you were uh, talking about EPDs. And um, maybe we'd open this up to uh, both Rob and Kara, the question was if we know if there are any incentives or grants that might, um, you know, push the manufacturers or make it easier for manufacturers to head towards getting an EPD done. Are we aware? Have we heard of anything like that? I specifically have not heard of any incentives for that. I think that, you know, most people, you know, view it as a market transformation tool, right? right? Um, but, you know, early adopters, you know, usually need some help, right, to, to go ahead and get there. But, but having said that, uh, you know, I think here in the U.S., I, I'm, I'm unaware of any incentives or grants that are available for manufacturers to start going down this path. That, that will be, I think, a very interesting dialogue at our uh, quarter one forum that we have with manufacturers. So I thank you, Francesco, for that question. Yeah, I, I like that that question too. So, you know, when we look at the Toronto market trying to prioritize um, how we uh, fund these, especially for embodied carbon data, is, is a good good question that we can ask some of those organizations I put on the first slide. 
Um, quick and easy question on challenge slide number four. Um, I had some data showing a traditional uh, design summer peak and an air source heat pump design winter peak. That was for a specific multi-unit residential building that we were studying um, where they wanted to go to electric but weren't sure how to do it. And we had studied the various different energy intensities in that actual building. And also, Kara, you had, um, you mentioned that one of the challenges also will be to convince clients to go ahead of uh, code or um, does anyone want to speak to any, um, any lessons learned or uh, anything they could share on how to do that? It's a good question. Um, one of the things we try to do is um, start dialogues uh, about both the impact of the buildings we have and about risk mitigation. So some clients who don't have their eye on um, an environmental goal might be interested in limiting exposure to um, high energy costs. One of the exciting things about an air source heat pump is it only uses one unit of energy for each three units of energy it produces. So um, its sensitivity is limited. And if you're doing a hybrid system, it gives them the ability to fuel switch. It's not perfect, but those are some of the kinds of conversations we've started having. Um, we're also really trying to um, figure out which upgrades are less expensive, which upgrades um, qualify for things like save on energy funding and be able to put those forward to our clients. I saw another couple uh, questions. One was regarding the performance gap. How can we close the gap? Um, I, I was being a bit disingenuous because there have already been a number of really good uh, measures put in place by particularly BC Hydro and, is it BC Hydro? Um, the BCBC Building Code and uh, the Toronto Green Standard to try and close that performance gap. So they now require that we do um, building uh, thermal bridging calculations and create a more realistic uh, clear wall R value to put in our energy models. And that, that helps. Um, another thing we can do is study how people are actually using energy in buildings. Um, I have access to early results from something I'm hoping to get published this year, um, showing that at least for the uh, condominiums in Toronto, their building uh, flood load use is very different than what we're seeing in some of the energy modeling guidelines. The energy modeling guidelines pr uh, predict that basically uh, all the plug loads will be off between two and six in the morning. And in fact, we saw that people really never turned down what was going on in their suites to blow about a third. At the same time, their peaks weren't as high. So those kinds of changes in the way people are actually occupying buildings mean that the model isn't looking at what people end up doing. So it's not making accurate predictions. Um, finally, that air tightness testing element, it's very key. Uh, we need to test the air tightness of our assemblies. Um, there's data out of Seattle showing that just adding a requirement to test improved um, a construction team's achievement from submission to submission. So without having a target, just knowing what was actually happening helps uh, our construction industry get better results. Thanks, Carl. We have another uh, a couple, other question here. There's one that's insulation. This is from Rami. Wire coatings and piping are highest priority substitutions because they all have the highest impact um, of all the MEP materials, question mark? Actually, they were our highest priority because we know that they have high health impacts and because they're very simple materials, so they're easier to generate EPDs for. Um, we know that it's going to be a bigger challenge to get EPDs for some of the more complicated products like air handlers. So we thought those were going to be good, easy wins to start getting our team familiar with EPDs and to start addressing some of those really big health hazards that exist in buildings. Yeah, there, there are fewer constituent parts that have to be accounted for in those kinds of materials. So uh, in terms of generating EPDs, those do appear to be, you know, much better targets or at least simpler targets. While chillers and boilers and air handling units and air, other air handling equipment, you know, kind of follow along. Having said that, uh, you know, the the three vendors that we have lined up for the MEP 24 quarter, uh, 2040 quarter one 
uh, forum. Uh, we've got train, carrier, and uh, interestingly enough, duck, duck socks uh, are the three vendors that are you know going to share information about their their specific journeys on the embodied carbon you know uh, uh, pathway. You know, I've had you know periodic conversations with other other vendors, uh, including you know those that uh, manufacture. Uh, diffusers and, and VAV boxes and, and that sort of thing. And, and, you know, they're, they're pretty frank. They, they haven't started, right. They're, they, they acknowledge that, you know, they're, they're behind, they, they want to understand, you know, more about what's happening with others, learn the lessons that are available to be learned as they start their own specific journeys. Mm, there was one question at the very beginning um, about do we uh, know any manufacturers who are ahead in EPDs? That was with Eric gave that question. So I understand Swagon, uh, who are a um, air handler manufacturer, have EPDs available for their products. Um, I'm just literally name dropping the only person who said, oh, yes, I have one when I've asked so far, but we, we are still in the very early stages of asking. Yeah. It's been one year. Hmm. Um, there was another question here about the performance gap and just wondering, they're noticing on the, the graphs that you were presenting, Kara, that they uh, have had the same performance from 98 to 2019. And the question was, how can we practically close that gap? That, that's right. So that's where um... Air tightness testing our buildings, um, more realistically representing our building thermal envelopes and more realistically um, representing what's happening inside the buildings. So the operational um, assumptions, I think, is going to really help. And then once we're predicting the right thing, then we can start reducing it. Um, I'm excited about... Uh, Lucas's question here, should building owners focus on building or taking part in community or district energy projects, or rather spend time individually decarbonizing buildings? Um, this is, I think, a great question, especially because sometimes you have the opportunity to create a home for a new district energy system in a building when you're doing a development. So that question becomes, do I build my own? Do I work with a developer? Um, if you can get a zero carbon district energy solution or plant, you should definitely do it because you'll, your actions will impact more than just your building and you'll create that net zero energy. Um, if you hook up to or build a natural gas district energy plant today, especially if you start planning one today, you won't build it till 2030. Then those boilers will be 11 years old in 2040. That, that system will not get decarbonized. So I think the takeaway for me when I, I looked at that, again, that's sort of data coming out of a study I did with um, architecture, or sorry, with the 2030 district, was that um, we need a clear path to creating zero carbon district energy systems because district energy systems have 30 year contracts with their clients that don't include an extra rider for decarbonizing. It, there's, there's no budget line item when you once you own a natural gas based district energy plant for getting it decarbonized by 2040. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. I, um, I'm looking at the time. Maybe we have time for one last question here. And I see this last one that came in from Rami. What are the highest impact strategies to reduce MEP embodied carbon that we know of so far? So what's, what's the biggest bang? Let's go out with a bang here. How should we prioritize that? Maybe Rob? Do you, wow, do you... that's a that's a very big question, right? <laughs> because the you know the biggest impact you can in can make around this is what you don't do, right? What you don't design or install, right? So so this issue of energy efficiency, so that the equipment and you know hopefully decarbonized equipment that you do in, install is smaller and and more efficient right that's still probably part of the holy grail right um you know amory levens from rocky mountain institute has always sort of you know talked about you know th this is sort of the hidden gem that continues to keep on giving when you design in an energy efficient way it continues to give back 
right? Uh, from from an impact uh, perspective. Um, so, you know, uh, how we can efficiently and effectively design less, make spaces more efficient, make the systems that serve them more efficient. How do we utilize them so that they are multi-mode? hybrid types of systems so that we don't have to always rely on machinery, right? To maintain thermal comfort and lighting inside of spaces. You know, I, I hate to sort of revert back to the, we just need to design better buildings <laughs> aspect, but we do, we need to design better buildings uh, that we are doing. And, you know, those of us who are HVAC designers, you know, we have to design systems to overcome less than optimal design decisions that have been made by others, right? Um, you know, with, with regard to the the systems that we are designing and 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 you know the the equipment that sort of goes in, I, I think as as Kara has sort of identified, you know, there are there are, there is some low hanging fruit from a decarbonization embodied carbon perspective that we we really do need to pay attention as the rest of the industry catches up, you know, insulation, sheet metal, piping, right? These are simple materials that that can be, uh, uh, you know, can can quickly go through the EPD process so that we're, you know, really looking to decarbonize those while things like chillers and package units and air handlers are, are going through their processes to get uh, to, to really sort of attack their your supply chains uh, and get their embodied carbon calculations really uh, satisfied uh, and then, you know, out for the industry. Yeah, I, I guess if I had to choose just one thing um, for a low carbon solution right now, it would be to make sure that you design the HVAC distribution system so that it's compatible with uh, future full decarbonization without requiring that the system be removed. So for me right now, that looks like hydronics because I don't have full confidence of you know many other solutions as a low temperature hydronics systems is, is a really good option. Um, but I think a lot of the data coming out of uh, MEP 2040 will be really exciting and will help drive this conversation forward and give us better data to tell you about next year. Great. Well, thank you to both for your time and everything you've done. We really appreciate it. We have a lot of people thanking us for this. And so, like I say, we'll have this um, uh, PowerPoint, this, this presentation available, the video recording, and we have more events coming up. Um, and thank you so much, Rob and Kara. It was great. All right. Everyone, thank you to have everybody. A good day. Thank you, everyone. Bye.